Mm, dear attendees, uh, meet Stefan Peters. Uh, Stefan is professor of peace studies at Justus Liebig University, Giessen in Germany and director of the Colombian German Peace Institute, Instituto Colombiano Colombo Alemán para la Paz, Capaz in Bogota, Colombia. He holds a PhD in political science uh, from Castle University and worked extensively on natural resource-based development models, brain theory, uh, social inequalities, and social environmental conflicts. Um, um, Stefan, please, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Ariel. Thank you, Franklin and Sanchi for invitation and Ariel for the introduction. And well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Good morning. I'm uh, actually uh, currently in Bogota. So here it's, um, well, eight o'clock. And yes, um, as Ariel just uh, introduced, I would like to talk uh, briefly and afterwards, hopefully, uh, discuss quite a long with you on the opportunities and challenges of the um, global energy transition and um, basically working on Latin America. So I will uh, focus also um, on Latin America. However, I suppose that there are some uh, points which might also um, well be similar in other uh, regions of the world. So first of all, I would like to start with that. Probably you all know it, um, these, um, these slides, these graphs, which shows us that, um, well, we are not doing actually well in terms of sustainable development. So uh, in the global north, we managed to get high um, human development according to the uh, UNDP and, well, indicators, but only uh, with overconsumption. So basically uh, what this slide uh, shows us is we have to change the model. And actually this is already a uh, kind of mainstream. This is, uh, as you have heard um, in the introduction uh, made by Ariel, I'm from Germany. So here are some examples also from Germany, but I guess we could actually uh, say that's pretty much the same in other parts of Europe and other parts of the world. So, um, I would say that the energy transition is already part of the mainstream. So just think about uh, the European Green Deal, Friday for Future, uh, which uh, is kind of a very much, uh, well, a broader uh, social movement from, from youngsters, but also in the economy. So from business, there is a lot of uh, thinking and a lot of um, at least uh, discourse on change towards a uh, global energy transition. So basically, um, in the heart of this uh, global energy transition is we have to get out of fossil fuels. So um, there are few people, of course, there are still people who might uh, uh, negate it, but um, there is, uh, let's say, um, a growing consensus that we have to go out of oil, gas, coal, and we have to uh, look, uh, well, um, climate neutral uh, energy sources and Basically, um, the star of all this discussion is green hydrogen. So, um, well, what I would like to do um, today is ask, uh, what does that mean for Latin America or for the global south, and especially for Latin America? So, first of all, I think we have to see that um, this energy transition is really um, important. We have to do so, but we should also be... Uh, aware that this uh, means has uh, important consequences for the global south and in my case i will talk more about latin america so first of all um if we go out of fossil fuels we have to ask ourselves what well, what happens with these countries or regions that maybe at the country level at the national level that maybe at the local level that are um well um very much dependent on fossil energies and secondly, and that was something Ariel already uh, told us in his introduction, talking about lithium, one of the critical metals of the energy transition, uh, we are facing basically a form of a transformed, but also reloaded extractivism, a green extractivism. Some would even uh, be more critical and talk about a green, a new green colonialism. 
let's start uh, with um, the first point. Here you see data from the UNCTAD, and uh, basically what we see is that the Global South is natural resource dependent. This is of this is of course not a new uh, or no no news for you. Uh, however, what we also see is that uh, Latin America is specifically um, dependent on these uh, natural resources. Uh, we have talks in Latin America or discussions for around 15 years about the topic of extractivism. And there are some countries like Venezuela, like Ecuador, also Bolivia, which are particularly dependent on uh, fossil fuel exports. However, even at the local level, we could uh, also talk or in um, Colombia, also in the south of Argentina and uh, some parts of Peru, some parts of Brazil, uh, a large dependence, especially on fossil fuels. Um, so, um, if we look at scenarios uh, for the prices of uh, fossil fuels, uh, well, it depends, and uh, forecasts are generally not that uh, not that clear. However, there are some, especially uh, Wood McKenzie, a global consultant, but also um, the Total Energy, who have a kind of um, forecast which would say, well, the prices will at least at the midterm um, will uh, decrease quite importantly. If you ask OPEC, uh, situation is different. However, um, there are even in within the energy um, sector, uh, a lot of voices who would say, well, let's prepare for the global energy transition. And this global energy transition will probably mean that demand for fossil fuels will reduce in mid and long term scenarios. And also um, this will mean that we will have problems uh, or there will be a reduction, a very much necessary if we uh, think about the climate, a reduction of uh, the extraction and the demand of fossil fuels. So oil, gas and coal basically. So uh, what does that mean? So first of all, uh, if you think, for instance, on the Green New Deal of the European Union, there is a, a kind of um, a lack of interest of what does that mean? So Leonard et al. Um, already two years ago um, wrote, well, the European Union needs to wake up to the consequences abroad of its domestic decisions, the decisions to get out of, uh, out of fossil fuels. Once again, uh, please don't get me wrong, I think that's pretty much necessary to do so. However, there are consequences, of course. These are, for instance, socioeconomic crises in these uh, zones of sacrifice of fossil fuel extractions. Um, so basically economic uh, downturns, um, dependent dependence of natural resource of fossil fuels would mean uh, also growing uh, social problems, um, especially also um, unemployment, it might have to do with political problems that might bring geopolitical instability. Uh, so uh, think about uh, the situation in Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela um, in a huge crisis, not because they decided to go out of uh, uh, or to reduce the extraction of fossil fuels, but rather because they did not manage because of what well, we could discuss it later if, uh, for various reasons. They, um, the, um, the extraction of oil especially has reduced uh, fiercely and together with the downturn of oil prices this, uh, was the major cause of the fierce economic crisis in Venezuela with a lot of uh, migration to the uh, neighboring countries. So um, this is, uh, of course, one of the possible scenarios also for other parts of the world, for other parts of Latin America, for other parts of the world, if the demand uh, for fossil fuels will reduce. And we might think that uh, a reduction of uh, extraction of fossil fuels will have positive social environmental consequences, as, of course, extraction and also the burning of these fossil fuels means uh, quite uh, well fierce um, negative consequences for the environment. However, that is not that sure. So, for instance, um, as these uh, regions are very much dependent on natural resource extraction and export, 
so they have to look for alternatives but generally these alternatives are also in the extractive sector so um, that might mean um, first of all getting out of the of the soil as much as possible uh, while there is still a global demand especially having in mind uh, nowadays uh, rising uh, energy prices also with the crisis uh, what was the war in ukraine and the, and the situation in the middle east but also uh, looking for other uh, natural resources that can be extracted for instance uh, in mining um, looking for um, changing the extractive um, uh, model um, towards um, basically mining of minerals. So um, if we ask for, well, perhaps uh, we could call it the ugly sides of sustainability. So first of all, we have these crises in uh, societies that are pretty much dependent on natural resources and here especially on uh, natural resources linked to fossil fuels. But we also have uh, the situation of mining for sustainability, for instance, the lithium uh, issue, but we could also talk about uh, about copper, about um, um, and nickel and other um, the rare airs and so on. So a, a lot of other minerals we need for the global energy transition. Um, but, um, well, in the Amazon, for instance, we also find another uh, point which has to do with deforestation for sustainability. It's basically uh, some of the precious wood from the Amazon, especially the so-called balsa wood, is uh, has a lot of uh, increasing demand because uh, what you can do with that is uh, basically constructing, it's a very light uh, wood and you can use it for constructing um the uh, windmills uh, you need for getting uh well clean energy and there is a lot of uh, deforestation especially in ecuador and it's getting exported to east asia so we also see that we have these unintended of course consequences of the energy transition and last but not least there is the boom of hydrogen and especially um when i will talk in the next minutes of hydrogen I will talk uh, of green hydrogen. Of course, we know that there are other colors of hydrogen, but especially in order to uh, for decarbonization, for a green energy transition, um, the focus will be probably on green hydrogen, that is hydrogen generated from uh, renewable energies, especially wind and solar power. So um, here are some uh, voices from, uh, well, um, some politicians um, uh, here, for instance, Ursula von der Leyen from the European Commission. She uh, told us already two years ago, well, clean hydrogen is a perfect means towards our goal of climate neutrality. And uh, also from academia, we find um, these enthusiastic uh, visions on green hydrogen. So hydrogen is gaining momentum in the current global energy transition framework. In fact, a great and widespread uh, enthusiasm is growing up towards it, as indicated by the current worldwide economic and political strategies, which endorse the carbon neutrality by 2030 and a fast transition to clean energy. And uh, this is not only uh, talk by politicians or academia, but also um, we can find it in, well, real world politics. For instance, in Germany, but also in other parts of, of Europe, of the global north, we find uh, the new German hydrogen strategy, uh, which uh, tells us green hydrogen is the oil of the future. According to the slogan, shipping the sunshine, we can produce green hydrogen in regions with plenty of wind, sunshine, and water, and we can export it to satisfy world's energy demand. Well, they should also say German's energy demand, of course. And Olaf Scholz, uh, the uh, Chancellor of Germany uh, currently, tell, uh, has recently had a, um, a visit to um, different parts of Latin America, of South America, especially Argentina, uh, Chile, and Brazil. And one of his uh, main points in the agenda was actually energy. And not only energy, but green hydrogen. So, and he... Um, um, told um, to the press in these wizard, well, many countries want to generate uh, welfare through the production and export of hydrogen. 
and Germany is a wanted partner as we care about environmental standards and decent work. So um, here we can see this enthusiastic uh, vision on green hydrogen and the uh, focus not only but also on Latin America. Here we can see a uh, global potential for hydrogen trade and look at uh, Latin America. There is ki uh, kind of a lot of uh, potential, but we can of course also see it in Northern uh, Africa and some other parts of the world as well. So we can find here um, the markets and the, um, well, both the, um, the possible uh, suppliers and the uh, demand. And uh, that might not be that different from what we already know from the global flows of natural resources. Um, but, um, and I think that's important to stress, this enthusiasm on uh, hydrogen is not only, um, or we cannot find it only in the global north. Here, there are two uh, quotes or two more quotes, one from Alicia Barsena, the director of the um, United Nations Commission um, for or Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. As a, in Spanish, it would be CEPAL. And she uh, wrote, well, the transition towards uh, renewable energy is a powerful engine for growth, poverty reduction, job creation, and contributes to the protection of our climate. So basically, here the position uh, from Alicia Barsena, a very important uh, person uh, from uh, well, uh, policy uh, um, related uh, institution like the CEPAL, who uh, embraces uh, this kind of green extractable. And Irene Veles, the former um, Minister of uh, Energy um, and Mining in Colombia of the current Pete, um, government of Gustavo Petro. Um, was, she is actually from academia. Uh, she comes from academia. She works on extractivism, has a kind of, no, a very critical position on extractivism in her academic work. However, she also said, well, green hydrogen is the future of the world's energy. Thanks to Colombia's important natural resources, wind, sunlight, water, our country has a competitive advantage which allows us to become one of the principal actors of the green hydrogen market. So uh, basically, uh, what we can see is uh, a lot of interest on uh, of both sides, so both of the global north and the global south, south um, regarding uh, the green hydrogen market. And well, here you can also see it's not only, of course, uh, Latin America, we can also see, for instance, South Africa, I already talked about uh, what I already mentioned, um, the MENA region. So there are a lot of uh, regions in the global south who embrace this uh, energy transition and see uh, the potential, stress the potential uh, for uh, well, engaging in this new upcoming market, which today still is not really, uh, there is no real market, but um, the forecast um, and tells us that in the next years um, that might change and there is a lot of uh, enthusiasm. However, uh, we can also um, have a more critical position on that. For instance, Felix Maltedorn and others talk about this kind of climate change consensus. So having in mind the idea of uh, David Harvey, who talks about the technological fix, this is probably something we can also see in this uh, global energy transition. So basically, it comes from the green economy, Green New Deal ideas that, well, we just have to have more innovation, find new uh, technologies in order to fix our um, ecological problems in order to uh, face climate change. And uh, basically, these um, uh, climate change consensus leads us to what we already talked about, um, the so-called green extractivism. There is a growing literature uh, which uh, well, deals with this uh, term. 
And for instance, um, here, uh, Dawn et al. tell us, well, in regions of extraction, for instance, Latin America, the climate change argument adds a new layer of legitimacy to the classical modernization and development paradigm, leading to the acceptance of social inequality and environmental destruction. That is what we can see here. So Alicia Barsena tells us, well, we need it for classical uh, development, but also to protection of our climate. And that is something which is this new argument. Um, however, it is not only the status quo. We also find uh, green mining in the global north, for instance, in Scandinavia. You are probably more familiar with that than I am. So there are perhaps also some changes which also has to do with uh, diversification of uh, natural resource supplies, a topic which has grown uh, or has gotten a growing importance, especially after the beginning of the war of aggression of uh, Russia against uh, Ukraine. Um, um, well, and, oh, okay, I, okay, thank you. So I will uh, just speed a little bit up. So, uh, however, uh, when it comes to this um, position of the new oil, that is a kind of, um, uh, or at least for me, I have been uh, wondering, well, um, they uh, talk about the new oil in a way as if oil has been, uh, let's say, um, very, very positive for the global south. And actually, we knew, we know that that has not been the case. So basically, um, what I would like to suggest is uh, getting insights of rentier theory in order to understand what are also the problems, the challenges, the risks of um, the new green hydrogen um, boom. So basically, if it comes to rent, then, well, actually, it is a kind of simplistic um, idea of rent. That is an income that is not linked to labor or investment efforts of the recipient. That means that the rent tier income, um, well, you do not need um, continuous reinvestment. What you would need in a classical capitalist uh, development, um, you are, if you do not need the continuous reinvestment of your income, then you can use it uh, in a way um, you like, so you can distribute it based on social and or political criteria. Um, and then, well, when it comes to um, natural resources and development and theory, we have different positions. We have the resource course, we have the rentier state. In the last uh, decades, we had a lot of discussion, especially from Latin America. But as far as I understand, uh, these discussions have uh, already been embraced also in other parts of the world on neo extractivism. And I think the point of neo extractivism is important because it links um, to some degree the more classical debates on the um, social economic and perhaps also political uh, dimensions of, uh, of uh, natural resource dependence on dependence of rent income with a focus on political ecology and the critical impetus, which um, I also take in my work on rentier societies, where the point is not that much as we generally discuss it in resource curse discussion, well, is a country cursed or blessed by natural resource, but uh, rather to discuss who wins and who loses, uh, both at the global, at the national, and at the local level. And um, and so let's, in the last five minutes, um, just uh, delve into uh, what does it mean for Colombia um, as one part. Actually, the green hydrogen in Latin America is a little bit more uh, developed in uh, Chile and perhaps also Argentina, but Colombia is one of the new uh, stars at the sky of green hydrogens. And that's also because it's closer to the European market, for instance. And actually, when you look at the Columbus Hydrogen Roadmap, which has already been uh, um, published by the former government of the um, well, right uh, from, from the political right, Ivan Duque, um, then we can see it is basically um, continuous uh, continuity within change. So whereas uh, before or still, 
let's be let's be true. Um, Colombia is still quite dependent on the export of fossil fuel, especially carbon. Actually, that has increased in the last years. But the idea is to get out of uh, fossil fuels, and that has been much more stressed by the current government of uh, left president uh, Gustavo Petro. So getting out of fossil fuels, embracing the energy transition, and however, and that is uh, the discussion, if it's for the local development or rather uh, just changing one natural resource uh, for another, a greener, in this case, from my point of view, a better um, a better option, but just changing it into um, a form of green, uh, green uh, extractivism. So basically, it is still the focus of the export of nature in order to quote uh, Coronil, a colleague who has unfortunately passed away already from Venezuela, and also the dependence of the rent income. So um, from a more theoretical pers uh, perspective, um, perhaps uh, in the political economy, there will not be so much uh, change. Uh, however, we also find, and that comes more from political ecology perspective, uh, already in Colombia, especially in the northern parts of Colombia, at the La Guajira, at the Caribbean coast, uh, where there is a lot of potential for uh, generating um, green energy uh, through uh, wind parks, especially. But there are already uh, a lot of social environmental conflicts, especially with the local communities, the Wayu indigenous communities, who have very different perspective on um, on um, on what to do with the land. So on land rights, there are more collective ideas of land rights. Now, there is a lot of investment uh, coming in, in a very poor, historically marginalized, uh, impoverished um, um, region. And we have uh, conflicts, which are uh, both on environmental issue, on cultural issues, but also ecological, uh, um, eco no, also, um, conflicts about the economic participation of the um, what well, of the rent income and it is a, a region where we have really a lack of uh, water resources and uh, what you need for hydrogen is also water so we have also another part of or another point uh, of conflicts relating uh, water gravity and in Colombia, we also we always have to have in mind that we are in a peace process, but there are still a lot of uh, non-state armed actors active in Colombia, and especially in the regions of Colombia. And that is also true for the northern part of uh, Colombia. So there is a risk if there comes a lot of investment. Of course, these non-state armed actors are pretty much uh, interested in getting their share of these in investment as well. And if it's is about conflicts uh, or land conflicts. And you know a little bit of the history of Colombia. So land conflicts have uh, in the last decades, at least, if not more, uh, generally been, uh, um, well, uh, disputed in a very violent way. So basically, there's also a risk that um, these uh, investment will, first of all, strengthen the non-state armed actors, and secondly, uh, also um, be a problem for the peace process as uh, and will perhaps come with more uh, violence against uh, environmental leaders, against social leaders, uh, which we can also unfortunately see already. So um, perhaps um, some points where I would like to um, uh, stress in alternatives, perhaps just let me um, take uh, two points in order to close and afterwards discuss. Um, the discussion is, well, of course, we have to go out of uh, fossil fuels, but is it really um, um, a feasible and a, and a positive way to change the fossil fuels for green energy? Or should we also think about uh, changing or, um, well, changing the way what we do with uh, these energy resources, these clean energy resources? So might it be an option? in order to focus more on energy security, energy sovereignty, for instance, uh, in Colombia or in other parts of the global south. So not so much focusing on, um, on the extraction and export of these uh, clean energy, but rather on uh, looking for 
uh, using this energy in order to supply um, local uh, economy, but also the local population, where there is still in large parts of the population a lack of energy, of access to energy. And a second point, um, well, if it comes to these uh, big investment, what is the local participation and also the local economic participation? So, in, and that has a lot to do uh, with uh, the question I already mentioned, who wins and who loses, and here especially at the local uh, at the local um, level. So how can we make that um, this uh, will really be uh, beneficial for um, for the local um, for the local uh, population? How can we guarantee their share and how can we guarantee their participation uh, in the decision making process, which would also mean, well, we do not agree to do big infrastructure, big energy projects here, because we have other ideas of uh, land use, we have other ideas of uh, what we should do in uh, what is our um, idea of the economic uh, future of these regions. So, uh, well, this is in German, but uh, thank you very much uh, for your intention. And I uh, hope that we have uh, food for discussion right now.